very chilly morning here in South Africa. Uh, I hope you warm wherever you are in the world. We've got a very interesting show again this morning. COBRA, of course, is a pro bono initiative assisting businesses in financial distress during COVID-19. We offer a range of advice, financial, legal, even human resources. Uh, and this morning is, is, is pertinent because we're talking to Catherine Young and Jake Phillips about caring for people uh, within your, your, your business, within your institution. Um, it, it's great to have you here on COBRA. And this morning, we continue with our Think Room series uh, with Catherine Yang. Catherine is an African entrepreneur with executive level experience across a number of businesses, including a successful corporate career, holding various senior and executive positions in companies, including Deloitte, Chevron, and SAP Ariba. Her capabilities are underpinned by deep engagement and care for people across her work career. As the founder of Think Room, she's involved in entrepreneurial ecosystem development across Africa and the UK, as well as acceleration programs through her co-ownership in Grindstone Accelerator. Catherine is an SME ecosystem influencer in Africa and works with clients in the space of entrepreneurship development across the continent. Catherine holds a BCom with specialization in marketing and, and a national diploma in procurement from the University of South Africa and Nelson Mandela Bay University, respectively. We also welcome Jake Phillips. Jake uh, is an American from Austin, Texas, but he's currently based in Ireland um, and working at Dogpatch Labs. He is heads up the community of 100 plus startups there in Dublin. Um, he led a scaled membership operations and community programs globally um, in recognized startup hubs in both the US and Dublin. He's done that since 2016. Um, Jake also manages uh, Dog Patch Labs first Fridays for startup programs, supporting early stage founders in partnership with Google. Prior to his work in ecosystem development, Jake was a product manager at a high growth startup acquired by Grubhub, managing the B2B delivery solution and worked in SAAS technical sales. Jake is passionate about personal development as well as helping funders, founders and their businesses become the best versions of, their, of themselves. So Catherine, over to you um, to continue with the show. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. It's lovely to be back. And thanks to everyone who's, um, uh, who's coming on a Monday morning, wherever you are in the world. We were talking just before the time, uh, just as we started this, uh, this session. It's just weird how the weather is weird and the world is still weird. And isn't it a wonderful opportunity just to... Uh, to just be weird with it and, and, and learn and grow. So today we're going to be talking about people. And I think uh, for those who know me, I want to just share my screen. For those who know me, it's uh, something that is incredibly, incredibly uh, important um, to me. And I don't just say that. I think for me, people and people management and looking after people and caring for them and and especially in times like this, where it's all just really still settling, is important to me. Um, important in many ways, because I sometimes think uh, I overthink uh, this too much. But really, for me, it's, uh, and, and I think you will agree with me, without the people, really, what is a business? And without people, what what is an economy? And, and, and what is a world? So... I'm going to take this session in three parts um, today. We, we're first going to just talk a little bit about setting, uh, just setting the scene a little bit. And I want to share some of the experiences that I've had definitely over the last while. Um, COVID, in fact, we don't even want to talk COVID anymore. What happens after COVID? Um, uh, so, but, but really what we've been experiencing from a people point of view, and I would want to share some insights with you. After that, we're going to be talking to one of our entrepreneurs that we work with extensively, one of our Grindstone alumni. So um, as, um, as Gary introduced earlier um, uh, on the call, um, I'm, I'm the owner of Think Room, but we are co-owners uh, with Knife Capital, a venture capitalist in Cape Town, you, you would know them well. Um, and we have this accelerator called Grindstone and we take 10 to 15 businesses through that accelerator every year um, to try. And these are businesses who want real exponential growth. Um, and, and, and we bring, and Grindstone brings uh, 
two things to entrepreneurs. The one side is through Knife, we bring the funding, and through Thinkroom, we bring the access to clients and markets. So it re works really well. So we then going to, in the second part of this call, bring in a grindstone alumni, um, Lindy Engelbrecht. She has a specifically, she works um, their business is, uh, is rec in recruitment and uh, they've digitized recruitment in very interesting ways. But what I've asked Lindy to just come share with us then for five or so minutes is what they have been seeing, what are the trends, what have happened in recruitment, specifically in South Africa, what looks different, um, and what is still the same, and any lessons for us as business owners uh, that we can learn from in terms of what, what, what now and how do we ha handle people um, and the crisis around that. And then lastly, we will then uh, cross over to Jake. Um, I really am so, uh, the, uh, I, I admire the work that Jake does specifically um, with entrepreneurs and businesses. Uh, the first Fridays, I saw it uh, just uh, Friday gone by on LinkedIn again. They do amazing work with businesses across um, Ireland. And I want to get some of his inputs, especially on the on the people thing. So so allow me just to, to, to talk a little bit about um, about this topic and please pop some, some questions through. Uh, for those who uh, don't uh, always like, because could sound like a little bit of psycho babble, just uh, bear with us because if this is the most interesting time that I've certainly lived in my lifetime of 46 years and I'm sure many of you um, in, in similar ways. So there's just so much to learn and, and I'm learning every day and I'm failing every day and um, but my goodness, am I growing um, and in, uh, growing in ways that very often uh, feel so uncomfortable, but I, but I just know that I wish that for everybody during this time. So Carl Jung is one of the, uh, uh, one of the, I don't even want to call him a psychologist, one of the philosophers almost, uh, that's how I see him, uh, who I respect a lot in terms of how he saw the world and how he saw our interaction with each other and how one little drop uh, just makes ripples across our collective conscience and across the universe. And whether we believe it or not, we play a role. Every single one of us all the time, we play a role in this. And um, this particular quote from Carl Jung, we can't change anything unless we accept it. And thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. We have, uh, we, we have a lot of jokes uh, in the office that I'm going to share with you some of the, the things we have, but we have a water cooler Skype chat. And I know, I know that um, I often get uh, probably a little bit judged for thinking too much, but really for me, thinking is such an important part of being and uh, an important part of who we are. And I think this saying is so very true. Very a lot has changed. A lot has changed. And what we do about that uh, and how we accept that um, is all to do with our thinking and how we're going to be thinking about it going forward. If any of us believe that we will go back to a world uh, pre-February 2020, uh, I mean, that's just absolutely not going to happen. And for those of us who battle more with change than with others, I think uh, for those who really battle, they are now four or five months into their, their change management. So probably somewhere jumping in between level two and three of uh, accepting the change and not. But the reality is our worlds won't be the same. And I'm stating what is wet for a very specific fact, because everything we do going forward is going to be based on this and, and how nimble we, we are. So without people really the machine will just stop the the machine of the world the machine of how we how we think the machine of how we do business how we survive and the interesting thing with what has happened with uh, with with this machine is that it has brought work home and home to work and why i say that uh, i got schooled very in a very corporate fashion uh, in my career and had a couple of corporate positions where there was always this uh, almost barrier of work is one box and non-work is another and may the two never meet and if the two do meet, it is usually on a Friday afternoon, very briefly, um, at at one or the other, um, <laughs> at one or the other quick event at a corporate, and then you move away. But the reality is, what COVID has done, it has literally just brought these two into each other's spaces, and it's very, it's very important that we understand how we're going to deal with that. So, I want to just share a couple of thoughts. Um, 
uh, we always like to just talk through things uh, based on, on, on research. And uh, one of the la latest Gartner, Gartner trends impacting the future of work, I think this was an early to June article, if I remember well. Um, so literally, I just want to touch on a couple of these points, but, but this is the reality. And although we know it, allow me to just share this with you, because I, I, I actually want to make a couple of points around this. So we know that increase in remote work is going to continue. We know that the world of work and remotely having to deal with that is, um, has only just started. And in fact, if this was a business opportunities um, session, we would have spoken a lot about how many opportunities there are, but it's not. But that's the reality. Remote work is a new way that we're going to be living. And interestingly enough, therefore, data will be collected much broader and much more expanded. And I'm not going to state the obvious of what that means. But what I want to now talk about are the next three things. Employer as a social safety net. Now, the employer never really had the role as an employer as a social safety net. Uh, we've often had the role of a financial safety net, a sense of belonging, et cetera, et cetera. But really this mixture of work and home has now become more than just, um, just an employer, clinically an employer, and then you leave your, 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 your work and you go to your life and you, you come back. That's a darn big responsibility on employers. And when I speak employer, I speak very loosely. Any people we engage with, where they deliver work to us in some form or fashion, um, this is a very important point. The next one is this one of... Um, Separation of critical skills and critical roles. And then I'll come back to contingent workers. Now, truthfully, truthfully, think about your business or think about the, the role you are currently in or the role you have been playing in a specific business. Think about that. Get into that mind space for a moment and think about what it is you were responsible for and what you were doing. Okay. Now think about it again and think how much did we depend on our skills versus our role. So let me be clear, not how much I only on my skills and the role I have, but how much those around us in the group that we work with have been depending on my skills in a specific scenario and my role in a specific scenario. And what's very interesting, what we have seen is that this pandemic, as one example, there will be many more examples in our, worlds to come, in our world to come of many more disasters that will be coming our way. Um, goodness, I don't even, I, I mean, when I read that there's potentially a new swine flu uh, that they found in China last week, I just didn't even read further. I, I'm not ready for that. But, but, but the reality is that we are all in a different world we're in a different world within our homes within our works and here's the reality some people will ha handle the change differently or more difficultly or easier than others and you are going to see a major shift in your organization from where you used to depend on people with skills block and a roles block and those will get shifted in fact right now when we employ people, by God's grace, we are still in a position to employ people. We are employing people who can fulfill critical roles. And the skills is a complete different discussion. But right now, it's a role of can you manage the, 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 the ambiguity? Can you manage the conflict? Can you manage the panic? Um, can you manage change at the rate of change of change? Uh, to the nth degree, though, that is a very important point I wanted to just highlight on this piece of research. So as business owners, we have to accept that. And then the last, the last point I want to raise um, on this particular one is this emergence of new top tier uh, employees and employees, stroke consultants, or whoever you work with in your world. It's the reality the rock stars um, that we know and the rock stars that we've been depending on and that we've been working with over many years in many, uh, in many, many capacities. This pandemic has meant something for all of us individually and it's made us come to terms 
with who we don't know. In fact, there's so many things personally, as an example, in my toolbox that I had that got me through life. Travel is an example. The fact that I was able to always travel was one of my ways through many years of therapy that I could manage my own demons. On the 3rd of March, the 5th of March, when I had my last, last, last flight, that coping mechanism, that tool in my toolbox was taken away unexpectedly. So the point here is I, may, many of us will be battling with a lot of change that's happened um, because a lot of our tools in our toolbox have been shifted or changed, et cetera, et cetera. What is my point here? My point is, therefore, people react differently and people respond differently. And therefore, we will be seeing a new emergence of top-tier um, top employers and employees coming through. From an employer point of view, employers who are not willing and able to now go with the change, accept that productivity is not an eight to five, Monday to Friday in an office, to accept that people have to shop and work, to accept that there are local lockdowns and then sometimes you have to do a, a doctor's visit or a shop visit during work time. Those types of employers who won't get their heads around that will really battle with us, um, with, with, with how to continue in future. And the same for a new top tier of employee. We're seeing more and more that different, different people are showing up differently at work, uh, not physically, uh, usually like this on a, on a video conference, but they're showing up differently and they're bringing different things to what we knew um, in the old toolbox just three months ago, four months ago, let me remind you. So let me go through my last two slides and then I want to um, go over to Lindy and, and just talk to her a little bit. But now let's think about the people in our worlds and the businesses who are who, are, who have been calling in. Uh, I think you can see that this is a, a piece of work I'm really passionate about because I've realized very, very early in my career, I've got to surround myself with people that are better than me. I have to surround myself with people who can absolutely fill my weaknesses. Um, I would much rather grow a lot on my strengths and where my weaknesses are, understand them enough, but get people who are much better than me at doing that to do that, because then we can move quicker, we can move more efficiently, and um, we can really just make the world a better place. So the people in our worlds, I wanted to start talking about how do we communicate with each other now? I mean, let's be honest. We are now death by Zoom and death by Teams and death by Skype meetings. And the, the, the reality is that we meet for, because we have to and we really are um, urging just for human interaction face to face, which we don't have. So communication has become different. But the most important thing that we've learned, that I've learned over the last four months, is that if you have thought you communicated enough, you've got to probably double up with your teams, triple up, rather err on the side of over communication than under communication, because so much gets lost in translation. We were, um, I had a, a session with one of the team members uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, I was literally, it was just getting work done, so blah, 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 on a Skype chat. And I was just very factual when I get under stress, uh, you know, I just get the points done, blah, 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 blah. The work is work. And the person on the other side received that as a, a, a form of shouting, a form of uh, rudeness. Uh, but because ne neither of us spoke about it, neither of us knew. And by the end of the week, there was a lot of animosity and we had to sort that out. The reality is rather over communicate than under communicate. Know the different communication styles in your team. Uh, some people really just like to get this all done um, uh, through, through, through instant message. Some people really like still to get on a phone. Um, some people like to see face like this uh, with video. The reality is we all are different. So as leaders of your organization, do you know the communication uh, preferences of your different team members, um, of the different clients you work with, of actually broader people, of people, not just team uh, in itself? Do you know them? And do you have a balance between all of them? For me, I absolutely hate talking on a telephone. I always say I have a telephone to make calls and not to receive them. It's just not my style of communication. I'm useless at it. I'm, I really am. But the reality is, 
there's a sacrifice to be made because I know some people who are in this new world with me, that's their safety and that's their place. So do we all have a way of communicating regularly and openly with each other? Um, th that's the first question. The second one, it's more important than ever to have resources available for our mental health. Let's be honest. Have you seen those of you who have children? I unfortunately don't, but I see it with my niece and my nephew. These kids are frustrated beyond belief. This is a new way of the world for them. They, they don't understand it themselves. And then they still have to cope with the pressure of homeschooling and learning all of that. And, um, and, and, and you know, the, the change in routine and, and parents trying to balance all of this. So mental health more than ever, is so important and as leaders of organizations, leaders of uh, r running uh, groups of entrepreneurs, whatever that may be, um, do, we, do we understand this? You know, the thing I, I, I did very early in the pandemic and, and I continue to do so, and there's this question, where will you be three years, where, where were you when the pandemic hit, if somebody asks you that three years later? And, and I always say, I do not ever want to be known during this time, especially to have been unkind. What does that mean? Roll over, play, play dead? No, it doesn't mean that, but it means being open and honest. It means being absolutely kind to the other human being on the other side of a telephone call or a video conference call um, or a message, because we are all, the playing fields are level and we are all battling exactly the same thing. So mental health more important than ever. So now, do you have time that you ask your team or the people that you work with uh, to just take time out? And I mean that, and it may sound so weird right now because, uh, right, we, we're scrambling just to keep businesses together. We're scrambling just to, but an hour of quiet and silence and not and managing everybody's expectations to not have to pitch up is so much more valuable uh, to give people time to breathe and to think. And then, of course, many other mental health resources and um, getting people in to talk with the teams and getting people uh, to help with one-on-one -on -one coaching if need be. Just be very aware that this is a reality. Things are different. That's the third point I wanted to, to raise. The rules aren't the same. And we've spoken about this, but the reality is the rules truly are not the same. There are different working rhythms that will have to be accepted. Uh, different people work differently. And as you get tired, uh, and, and even more so, I have this question at the moment, who's caring for the carers? So by that, it also means that not only looking after the employees and the consultants and the clients that you work with, but looking after yourself as looking after people. Um, we had a particularly difficult week last week, as an example. We, I think we've pushed too many days without um, having a sleep or having a day off or something like that. And it was a particularly difficult week uh, for, for a number of us for a number of reasons. And the reality is, if you don't take the time to understand how the rules are different, so much uh, misinterpretation can come to the fore. So please, please, please watch out for that when you care for your people. And then lastly, leadership style. So we did speak about this. Different leaders will step forward. Different uh, leadership styles um, uh, especially those of us uh, who are hard drivers. I battle a lot with this right now about what is the balance between driving hard and getting the results versus taking care of the mental health of the people I work with and my own, uh, taking enough time off and then that, uh, and, and not, and not um, poor performers are poor performers. They were poor performers long before the pandemic. Let's be very clear about that. So, so having that balance between understanding when there is a performance issue versus just battling like the rest of the world to just try and get through this pandemic. I'm now going to go over to Lindy. Just want to uh, finish up on this. Make sure you do lots of celebrations. We do many of them. Fridays are always celebration days in some form or fashion. Have a glass of uh, bubbles together or a cup of coffee in the morning or whatever. Um, and then the health and well-being, staying fit. We've got a couple of challenges going. Um, I'm not doing too well at the moment, but we've got a kettlebell challenge going and there's a gym every second morning, gym Zoom session, and, but it's so important for our health and, and well-being. And then remember, we are all most concerned about job security right now. And we are, and it's only the start of it. And how 
um, how you will be speaking to the people in your organization and how you will be helping them through that. I say this very clearly, not necessarily saying, hey, I can confirm that the job will continue forever if you as a business owner can't, but the communication around this, everybody understands right now that this is a different world. So that's what I wanted to share with you from a, from a perspective of, um, uh, of just the deck. Lindy, I see you Ron. It's lovely to see you. I am. Um, uh, thank you for joining and, and really welcome. So bye, just by introduction, if you don't mind, uh, just over to you. Who are you? What does Digger do? So yes, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity, Catherine. It's lovely to just to participate in these discussions, which are so important, um, especially now. So my name is Lindy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Digger, as well as Win at Work, which is an initiative of Digger. And just as an introduction, who Digger is and who Win at Work is, especially in this time, which I believe we've become so relevant. Um, and I'm grateful for that. But Digger is a shortlisting engine for bulk applicants. So we're in the technology space and we shortlist bulk applicants with a techno or technology. And we elevate or alleviate the tedious and time consuming tasks for the talent acquisitions departments within your resources industry. So we shortlist automatically, we communicate to all applicants and induct them and onboard them and their families within the operations and within the offices where you recruit them from. So we connect people to their next great opportunity. So that's Digger on the one side. And then Win at Work is quite a new baby, if I can put it like that, where we've seen the changes taking place with the pandemic. And just before the pandemic hit, we wanted to start focusing on women within industry as, w as well as women in business and entrepreneurs. But the focus would be your African women. So we had an event last year, by the end of last year, and then when the pandemic hit, we said, you know what, we need to make sure that we've got diversity within our business to weather the storm within, with, within this global pandemic that we are in. So instead of panicking, which, to be honest, we did for about a week, I think everybody tried to get their feet ready, you yeah. know, within what's going on and what does the future hold for us right now. But then we decided to focus on the opportunities that this pandemic can bring us and sitting, strategizing with the team and said, where's the opportunities? What is changing for people and where does the value lie that we can bring to organizations? So in short, that is who we are. That's fantastic, Lindy, and you've been uh, you've also been doing a lot of good work, um, also on uh, just working with women in particular, and, um, and 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 your passion for that, and your and your heart for that. I appreciate yes. that because that's um, that really is just uh, an initiative that's also very much needed. So, okay, so. Tell us what you've seen. What have been some of the changes? So the pandemic hit. What have been some of the recruitment changes that you've seen um, just in, in the world that you work in and, uh, and how, how businesses have been going about this new way? So when we started, I think I need to take you back a little bit. So when we started Digger, so our background is within the recruitment space for the last 20 odd years without giving our age away. But for the, for the last 20 odd years, recruitment has been done in a certain way. And I think what has happened in our industry is people has almost rested on their laurels to say it will always be like this. And nobody could have predicted a global pandemic not one of us could, or the changes that might happen in future. When we started Digger in 2017, we were very excited to see what 4IR is going to bring. And we were watching the global markets and what influence it can have on a South African platform. Now we know first world countries are about four, five years in, you know, ahead of us, but we wanted to, for uh, an African market, stay in front of the curve. And I do believe we've done that. But 2017, people were looking at us quite strangely and thinking, why are you talking digital, digitalization, 4IR, technology, algorithms, you know, all these new terms that people need to, to get to terms with, if you excuse my pun. But what I've seen is the global pandemic has just brought technology conversations to the forefront. 
That has been the major change. But yeah. also that organizations and individuals within the organizations, whether it be your CEO, your talent acquisition head, your recruitment head, whatever your title would be within your organization, we still deal with people. And you aptly said that as we're dealing with people at the end of the day. And um, what they have realized is to say it's not a luxury to look at these things anymore. It is now such a necessity. So to give you an example, we had quite a number of clients reach out to us where they were taking CVs from individuals still quite old school and now saying, guys, we cannot do this. We need a platform where we can receive the, the applicants, but also to shortlist them in real time to make our tasks and to alleviate the pressure on us to get shortlisted and the right candidates in, in place. So I think from just a mindset shift, it has brought it forward in terms of, I would say, just getting people in the boardroom and having the conversations has changed. Yeah. And that I think is a, is a major thing. Yeah, I absolutely love that. So for, so for those on the call, I think um, it's, it's very important. We had it on a previous session as well. I think it was last week, Monday. But Lynn, you make such an important point. Um, this has forced us to go digital in so many ways and recruitment specifically, uh, it, it, it just is. So yes, you were ahead of your time, but which is a good thing um, yes. as, we stand, as we stand now. So tell me a little bit about... Have you, have you seen any change in terms of how women are handling this all during this time with the woman initiative you've been running? Yeah. So I think before I tackle women, um, I want to just say that we are all in the same storm, but we are in different boats. And I think that for me is applicable to all genders, but also specifically, specifically to women. And I do believe what I've seen with women especially is that we are leading with vulnerability. And that is quite a change for our corporate environments, as well as for us women, because I believe before the global pandemic, we compartmentalized our lives quite a bit. And if you're at the office, you are a woman in the office. You are a corporate woman or a businesswoman. And when you're at home, you are mom, wife, and we put on the different hats, you know. But I do believe what happens now with the pandemic, it blurs the lines between the two worlds or between these two or different uh, compartments. And I wanted to, I'm encouraging women out there and men, you know, let's lead with the vulnerability because vulnerability is the willingness to walk into uncertainty and risk and emotional exposure. And when you can see my child walking up and down behind me whilst having a strategic session with a team or with a client, we're having a laugh about it. And I think it's bringing humanity back to the boardroom or to a strategic session or to a team to say, we are humans dealing with one another and not just robots or a production line. And yes, we need to make money and bottom lines and your profit margins are extremely important in these times. But at the, at the very least, if we deal with kindness with our people, then our organizations are going to thrive no matter what, because our people will be loyal. Our people will be taken care of. Our people will serve us from a place of fullness and not a place of emptiness. And I think that is important. And that's what I've seen from women is the community around us, whether it is women or men, are becoming extremely, extremely important because that's where our support system sits. And the stronger our support system are, the better we can weather the storm together. And I think that's what I've seen. Fantastic, Lindy. And I, and I, and I love that response because for me, it's always not, it's never an issue of uh, male or female. It really isn't. It's about literally that vulnerability that you spoke to. Um, and I think, I think it applies regardless of male or female, like you said, but it's about just uh, because of the one program that you run with, with, with females. I just thought that was such a good point for you to raise and talk about this vulnerability because uh, for all of us on the call, male or female, regardless, yeah. 
this makes us vulnerable in a completely different way. And, um, and, and it's okay to be vulnerable yes. is what you're saying. Um, yes. we, we will get, and, and by God, I hope that the world changes and we are just much more vulnerable and less facades around the boardroom table, regardless. Um, and, um, and I speak with myself first, I think the one thing the pandemic's taught me the most is to drop my ego because e there's just no space for ego in a pandemic at all. Lastly, so lastly, and then I'm going to cross over to Jake. So, so lastly, Lindy, so what are your thoughts about just keeping on, keeping on until this thing is over? So for me, there's two parts or for, yeah, for us at, at Digger and then with Win at Work and just in general, I think it's two parts is keeping the main thing, the main thing. So, the world has become quite noisy. And if we jump to every shot that we hear in the world, I do believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to take our focus away of what we need to do, firstly, in our organizations, and that is to keep the main thing the main thing. But then the second thing is, I believe also that we need to be agile enough to adapt. Because when we adapt to whatever is happening in our environment, we will survive and we will thrive, I believe. Um, because we don't just want to actually survive in this, uh, in this uh, pandemic. We want to thrive in it and coming out of it, right? So for me, it is keeping focused, blocking out too much noise that the world is screaming, but also depending on who you listen to and who you, or how, what you focus on. Because what you focus on is going to form you at the end of the day. But yeah. then also a, a very strategic um, point that I want to make is how do we diversify our business and our corporate strategy, if you want. Because I do believe some of us, us included, became very uh, comfortable in just the main thing that we were running. So it does seem counterintuitive but, or contradictory, and it's not. So we need to focus on our value proposition, but we shouldn't just be comfortable in that. We must look at different income streams, different offerings, different ways to add value to our customers at the end of the day. And that is how the Win at Work initiative initially uh, raised its head, if you want, is we were looking at diversifying our offerings and then we saw this gap in the market to say we can add value in that area and i think that's that's my <laughs> end of my soapbox <laughs> it's been most it's been most valuable thank you lindy i've just popped uh, the bigger um URL in the chat and then if you can just do the win at work um, in the same way if you don't mind. Thank you very much lovely for chatting uh, very lo very lovely chatting to you so um, you can go off video and Jake if you don't mind coming on thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks hey, Jake. so much. Thank you so much. It's lovely. Thank you Jake. And then, Jake, if you can just come off mute, thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, so, so, so just for those that are on the call, so really a great perspective from Lindy now on just get, getting a new way and, and getting on with it. And the trends that we're seeing in the recruitment industry is that it has gone digital and that people have to go online in terms of finding work. So, Jake, thank you. Um, I know that uh, you've had the official introduction, but do you just want to quickly tell us who you are? Absolutely. Yeah. So my name is Jake. I head up the community here at Dogpatch Labs, which is uh, located in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I have the pleasure of knowing Catherine through this network. We're in globally called Google for Startups, um, which is fantastic. I see Will's on the call as well. So um, Dogpatch is an international community for Irish scale ups um, and startups from abroad that are coming to Europe or Ireland for the first time. Um, so we have the workspace. We have a number of accelerator and incubator programs that we would run for them to help accelerate their growth. Um, and then our ultimate goal really is to accelerate the development of the Irish tech ecosystem. So while a lot of what I would be focused on and my team would be inside the about 100 startups, 500 members we have in the community, making sure that they have talent and support and physical space and, 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 and funding to grow. Um, our remit as a business really is to support not only the policy environment, so that's been very top of mind with government relief schemes, um, to corporate innovation, um, all the way down to social innovators, um, supporting youth in tech and different diversity initiatives locally. So really, we're just trying to make Ireland the most attractive place for companies, for funding, uh, for talent. Um, so there's a lot of different irons in the fire. So it's been a fascinating time for us um, with all of these different facets that are going on. So, um, yeah. But really, myself would be focused entirely on the startups. How do we help them grow? 
uh, and make sure that they have what they need. So yeah. um, really exciting for us here right now. And thank you. You've been doing amazing work for our world. So thank you very much for that, Jake. I mean, that's sincerely. So we, we, we want to talk people, as you know, uh, a little bit with you today. And, and my first question really is, can you see any impact that's been with the teams that you have in your cohorts or that you've been working with since COVID has happened? What has that impact been? What's it looking and feeling like? Absolutely. And you actually raised some good points earlier, which I'm definitely going to cross back over on. But I mean, you had communication is absolutely critical right now. Um, I mean, understanding that the different styles, I think, has been something that a lot of our teams have been discovering is that, you know, you have 55, 60 percent of your communication is nonverbal when you're in person. And when you lose that, your ability to really effectively communicate with your team is stretched. And, and can you be tested to say, well, this person's actually slightly introverted or if you've done Myers-Briggs or DISC, DISC analysis and knowing which part of those they sit within. Some people don't want to be just dropped in with an email and say, hey, can you pick this up and, and jump on this to me? Yeah. We want time to look at it and digest. So I think we're learning a lot more about how people want to be communicated with, prefer to communicate back. So I think that's certainly something that we've been stressing at our teams is to take the time to understand that um, and the impact that that has on people's you know, just personal well-being. Um, so, so that's been something as well. Um, I, I think as well, the impact, a lot of people are looking for certainty uh, and leadership and looking for someone to take a strong position and that we're going to stand up and say, this is the way that we're doing it. There might be flaws along the way that we're open to feedback and responding. No one has had the perfect response in any of this, governments, startups or otherwise. So I think it's being able to take the information you have and, and, and take a stand and say, this is the way we're dealing with it and that we can adjust. So that's something that we've at least tried to provide ourselves. Um, and, the, and some of the leading startups that we've been working with, I think, have done as well. Um, impact, I, I mean, like certainty. I think we talk about certainty, but as well as what is the future? Like, what are, how are we building towards that? I think a lot of companies that have tried to just spin up and keep people busy for just the sake of being busy are, are seeing a, a huge diminishing return on that right now. I mean, certainly to keep people not thinking about impending doom three months ago is one thing, but now that we're three months into this and the world will continue, uh, how are we building things that are actually meaningful for not only your own personal growth, um, which is still very important as an employer to be building people's professional development, but as a company, as cash flow becomes such an important issue, are we having to furlough or lay people off or make pay cuts? What are we doing to provide that like future ray of this is where the business is headed? How are we refocusing our priorities on the one or two most important things uh, um, to get us through there? So. I think a lot of it is just people having to question and test their assumptions. It's been a really good ride for the last kind of six, seven years. Um, and so a lot of these startups that, you know, may have had a little bit of a comfortable ride till now have really had to say, you know, what are those two things that we can focus on or one thing even um, that's going to get us through this next period. Um, and, and maybe we have to take on some debt in order to get there. But um, the important thing is that we will survive um, in making those tough decisions. So yeah, um, I, I absolutely love that. So so, so definitely, the, uh, what you're saying is that the change is going to be with us, and 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 how we handle that um, within the uniqueness of the individuals, and then still making a company uh, uh, um, survive. I love what you said about the bit about those who had businesses just to keep people going we have a couple of those in some of our cohorts as well and i think that has really been watershed this has really been watershed for for those specific individuals and i think um what we've also found on our side of it, actually, i know this is not on the formal question but i'd like your mind on this what we also found on our side those businesses who were not very clear on their value proposition um or the reason for existing have really been battling a lot just keeping the motivation going for the business owners and for the teams to keep going because they came in unsure and this definitely is going to be watershed for them what's your feeling on that no no i mean definitely and that's why i said i mean it's it's looking at those like i said the what is what, what's your usp what makes you different i mean I, I i think it was lindy said something about the noise that's out there right now it, this gives us a two-sided opportunity moving on to digital and looking at these digital first. Absolutely, you now have a global reach to go after anyone, to bring any speaker and any talent from around the world, um, support systems. It, it represents an incredible opportunity. We've been able to bring in speakers from international organizations because of this. But the other side of that is everyone is, is doing this now. Everyone is on Zoom webinars. Everyone is providing free office hours or support or a free trial to whatever SaaS product that they're selling. 
So like, what is it now? Not only do you have to look at that global opportunity, reactivate new marketing channels, look at anything outside of the box of what their normal, normal day to day of what you're, you, you had been doing. But at the same time, you have to be laser focused into who's the audience that I'm targeting. Why is this unique for them? Why should they pay attention to me versus the 10 other people who are offering something similar online? So I think it's an opportunity to widen, but at the same time, you have to just be laser focused on who is that we're targeting? Why are we doing it? What are the messages that we're using and going out there with? Um, because again, it's, it's the time, time, you're just fatigue. Everyone is so yeah. fatigued being on a thing all day with your company and your teams. And then to be asked to get on and either be sold to, or to, to give a survey about how you're going to do product development. I mean, it's just people's time is so razor thin, uh, uh, these days online. So, so I think it's, again, it's kind of the two sided of absolutely you should be looking at these global opportunities and how are you expanding beyond what we're confined to this locality and we can't do that because of this and that. So many, I like said, so many people say, I can't do this because yeah. rather than this is an opportunity because there is no constraints. Like, don't think about, well, this is the way you've always done it. So this is how it must continue. Like, absolutely not. This is your one chance to smash everything down and build it back up from new. Absolutely. And the playing fields are so level. I, I know that we've got Q and A at the end, but I want to take this question because it's it, it's still it's so in the thre thread of what we're speaking. Uh, Renee's asking, do you do you see that business would need to review their vision, or find their new meaning of business after this? Hmm. I think uh, hopefully you have a very clearly defined why. I mean, it's, it's one of those, uh, I just go onto the mountaintops about uh, start with why. I mean, it's one of those books that I think I've read cover to cover about 10 times. I, I think if you haven't clearly defined what that is for your business, absolutely. I think that there are businesses that are reinventing either the products that they are providing or the services. There's pivots that we've seen across our community into delivering COVID services, health, you know, telemedicine solutions, delivery services that were doing food that are now doing medical supplies. I think you have to look at this and say, how are you recession proofing your business? Because whether people want to hear it or not, I do think that there's some lag measures that are coming on this in the next kind of six to 18 months. So what are you doing now to, pre to be prepared for that um, is certainly, um, I don't think that there's a need. I, I think, again, you should be asking yourself the hard questions now, whether it's Cash flow, you're, the team that you have, if you do need to make cuts, who are those people? Does that align with your vision 6, 12, 18 months from now? Is that person helping you get there? Can you reallocate resources into other teams? So, I, I mean, again, I think now, if, if you haven't done it now, it certainly start today of what are those things that you absolutely critically must have? You know, maybe it's starting from a cash flow model and, and working back into what can we yeah. afford to do so that we don't, we can keep everyone. Um, and, and make, like I said, making those tough decisions. Um, yeah, exactly. Asking your peer group about that. I think that's been the other thing that we've seen incredibly much so with founders, is leaning on your peers. What do I do here? Look, vulnerability is massive. Like, I don't know. Founders will always want to be that tough rock that, yeah. that is impenetrable. You have to... You have to ask a question. So, so, so I really like this uh, this point on on peers. So maybe we start that because with the next question. So, what are some of the best practices that you're seeing now um, to build and maintain teams? Can you talk a little bit more about this peer group thing? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, again, I guess leaning into that is kind of like a trust and psychological safety. It goes back to like a little bit of communication. You have to build that with your teams. Um, again, if you just talk about the hard decisions, if you are making pay cuts or furloughs, like if you don't have to pay bonus, if you're not gonna be able to pay bonuses, tell people as soon as you know that, not waiting until the all hands at the end of the month and kind of sneaking it in. People will know, know that you're BSing or, or, or yeah. did know. It's best to just get out in front of that. So I think that's something that we've seen really good teams do um, from here. Um, in terms of best practices, otherwise, I mean, again, it, little things I think have made a huge difference. Um, being vulnerable again as a leader, do an AMA and ask me anything as a CEO or a leader. Be, if you are able to share the books, share the finances and say, this is where we're at. This is how much cash flow we have. This is why we're making that decision. People are adults. And I think the management style that we're moving towards is away from this type A to a trust your employees, type B. This is a new worker that is able to work remotely and be effective and, and understand that the decisions you're making is for the best of the business, not so that they can take home a big bonus as an executive. Um, I think as well, again, it's little things. I think the physical office at your house is a massive improvement on personal satisfaction and the way that you work and effectiveness. The chair, the desk, the lighting, you know, getting up and allowing people to have breaks. 
Um, I, I think, again, it's more important things you don't realize until you're in it. You're working eight hours a day, but I'm not walking to the coffee machine. I'm not walking to go to a water every you know, five to 10 minutes. So I'm just behind my screen for 30% more time during the day. I have to go for a 20 minute walk in the morning. I have to go after lunch. Uh, otherwise, you know, you see it come down. Shorten those meetings is another thing. I think an hour on a team call and everyone's going through for 10 minutes and they're slot. I mean, how can you shorten it? What's the most important information? Could this get sent over an email? I think constant communication is important, but don't overdo it. Having an hour long stand up every single day with your team might not be effective. Could you do that in 15 or 20 minutes? Give everyone a 30 seconds, boom, boom, boom. Great, they're back into it. Um, the other thing is, is the personal, I guess, emotional trust is, is yes, you wanna have those public forums to say, what do people not like and share, but you need to have that in a one-on-one -on -one context as well. So having an opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one with your team, give it the meeting to them. Don't set an agenda, let that staff member tell you what it is they're worried about. What they're, it could be personal, it could have nothing to do with work, but them just being able to, maybe they live alone. They don't have anyone that they can unload this information on, certainly not in a professional context. So I think giving them that space, listening to your people um, and, and providing, again, like I said, that physical office set up at home uh, are, are some of the massive things that I've seen teams do really well. So it's something we tried to do, giving people certainty around rent, bonuses, you know, pay freezes, how can we support you? We're gonna give you a bu budget to go buy a desk or a chair for your home. We went and physically delivered office furniture to all of our staff in a van when this first kicked off. So um, those would be kind of some of the best ones that I've seen now certainly you know, there's, there's above and beyond as you get into the, to companies that value different opportunities as food and hampers at home and whatever else. But um, I think listening. That's, that's so very valuable, you know, especially the, the point that you raise uh, about the one-on-ones because we do, uh, and, and probably my culpa, I probably put hand to heart. I, I care. I, I, I put more focus on is the group okay uh, and probably neglect the individual. So that's really a lesson I've learned because uh, I touch base, but, but probably not uh, with an agenda that they bring. Um, and rather one of, hey, are you okay from my side? So I've, that's really a very, very good uh, lesson that, uh, that you've just shared with us. Um, the, other one, the other point you raised around uh, uh, the, the leadership going from a type A to a type B and being much more inclusive and, and much more in touch and in tune. And I know this is a little bit off script, but, but, but just go with me because I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're saying. What do you think that means for the future world of work? 10 years on. Absolutely. I, look, it's blended working. I mean, I think this experiment, you know, if anything, and not an experiment, has proven that there, the office is not dead, but it is certainly not going to be the same as what we looked at it before. So, like, how are we providing people the opportunities to live their best lives and therefore do the best work? The best employees are people that are satisfied, living very gratifying personal lives that are coming in, bringing their full authentic self, their best self, that they're not putting on a mask, they're not feeling like they need to do something outside of there. They are just bringing their full self and energy into that role. And that's where we're going to see companies fly. So I think the way that we interact with each other, I think, again, offices are going to be something of a unique blend of, yes, you need to still have that. There's no, you cannot replace an in-person. You can still supplement that. Virtual experiences can be just as good as in-person. And I think that's what companies are going to have to strive to figure out is how do we create an environment where person X in Toronto or, or wherever is, is just as engaged and able to whiteboard and share their opinions as person B sitting in Cape Town in the office, you know, with that. How are we providing flexible work hours so that that is still able to man itself, manifest itself? Um, and, and defining those boundaries, you know, after nine o'clock, don't talk to this, you know, yeah. they're, they have kids and I'm, I'm getting back off at four to get back on at seven because I have to pick up my son from school or he's, you know, so those are things that I think we're, we're starting to see, and hopefully, again, I'm in a bubble with the startup space where you have these great em, employee perks and very listening. I, I think you look at the SMEs and, and more traditional corporates that have now been forced banks, insurance companies that are not to pick on the financial sector, but you know that these traditionally slow and large moving organizations that have had to innovate really rapidly and have seen positive results. They have happier people. They said this can work. So I think it's about moving from that. Why this is why this won't work into let's redraw the box and say, this is like, this is a new reality. This is a way that we can do this. How do we provide the technology, the structures, the, you know, the HR and people supports underneath that to enable this to work. And it's gonna be messy sometimes. You have to test, you have to listen, you have to look at the data, 
but I think it's an opportunity for us to just smash down what's happened and, and restart. So, um, absolutely love that. I love the bit of it's got to be messy sometimes because that's the reality, and especially those of us who are incredibly hard on ourselves and know how the old way had worked. And if there's a, me- a lot of mess, it's difficult to get through that. I think you've just encouraged me also. So thank you for that. There's one more question, uh, then we will close. Um, uh, thanks, Will, for the question. So. Uh, we'll just say he loves what you're doing at Dark Patch. You know, we do, we do, Jake, we do very much. How do you manage the right contacts to the right contacts at this time? So as you are operating across a large ecosystem of companies, how do you connect the wants and needs at scale? That's a great question. Um, I, I have an incredible team. First of all, I have to say I am just one of, of many of awesome, awesome teammates here that, that really helped me um, pull that off. I think for us, it's about making that communication loop as short as possible. I don't want people to have to go fill out a form that's going to go and give you an autoresponder that will get to you in two or three days. That, like I give out my personal contact information to any and all of the founders in our community. It's like, send me a text, like send me, like call me, like whatever it is. I, I'm also you, Catherine. I don't like getting calls, but you know, I have learned to at least answer them. Uh, we have um, to do them. Yeah. I have to now. I have to now. Um, but I think for me, it's about, uh, about listening and having um, just a, a, always a finger on the pulse again. So uh, methods. I have surveys that we're collecting on a quarterly basis um, that are short. Again, very short. I want to get in and out five, six questions. Give me that data and reactionary kind of quick and on the ball movement. Uh, open door policy. So again, the texts, the Slack, just ask me those questions and come to me when you need that support. Um, so, so again, it's very top of mind. It's not waiting for some measure down the road. Um, having, again, an active team, people that are working on our finance are open and listening and saying, oh, I heard the startup is struggling to hire or this is happening. So activating that wider resource network, having champions as well. So whether that's a super user in your community or, 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 or user group that you have, someone who's that user that's also kind of you're in with that group who's going to tell you the things that they might not be telling you, this actually feature, this kind of sucks. Um, and no one's actually telling you how it is. Um, and then for us, there's actually a tool that I really liked. It's in beta still, but there's a startup here called Bridge um, um, here in Ireland. Connor Murphy's Techstars, ex Data Hug co founder, incredible guy. Um, it's an introduction platform. So it's actually been something I found really useful. He's coined it as kind of the LinkedIn killer, but um, it, it helps me make better and more high quality introductions easier. So I'm making 10, 15 of those in a week easy. Um, that, that to me at least provides, and I get to see what happens with that introduction. Did they do business together? Did they go and introduce other people? So it kind of builds this web of people that I've connected and then the connections that they've made. So I can kind of tap into that. So again, just maybe a little plug for him there, um, because I found it super valuable. Um, but, but I think again, to to be quite honest, Will, it's just having the open to, to listen. Um, um, having a good dashboard of, of, of management. I have an incredible analyst here who does spreadsheets and reports and we do these incredible um, data polls for Google for startups mostly is the forcing function for that. Um, but I think it's about creating the space to say I'm open to talk whenever you want. Here's a formal check in. If you don't want to talk, here's a form that you can fill in anonymously and tell me about it. So I, I think it's just find these multimodal deliveries that work for different people at the right time. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Jake. Jake. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it so much. Um, uh, really, congratulations for all the great work that you do. And um, Gary, I'm going to hand back to you for the close. Great. Catherine, Jake, thank you very much. And Lindy, that was absolutely fascinating. Thanks for being on the show. Um, as you've seen, perhaps in the chat room, we've got Eric Fenter tomorrow talking about leadership in transit. Um, then Patrick O'Donnell will be leveraging assets. On, th- on Wednesday, and uh, then we've got Klaus Tepper, he'll be doing cyber, cyber security, very fascinating, and of course Springbok, Bob Skinstead is on the show on Friday with Catherine, don't miss that one. Until tomorrow, thanks for all of you for joining, we'll see you again, bye.